Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway, a nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Browning, along with my co-host, Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning along with my co-host and great friend, Rob Berger. Rob, how are you doing today, bud? All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's uh, already well into January, first show for the new year. And we're going to highlight today the um, the broadcast or the uh, color commentator on radio for the New York Rangers, the Polish Prince, the Stemmer, Pete Stemkowski, number 21. But before we get into Stemkowski, let's just kind of review the goings-ons uh, around the league. A lot of stuff's been happening over the last week. We'll talk about some of the Ranger stuff that's going on and pretty significant stuff that's going on with that club, and we can touch on that. But I think the first thing uh, I was shocked to see over the weekend, shocked to hear, was that Ray Shiro was let go as the GM of the Devils. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, you know, it's, I think it sets, sends a bad message to what – is expected of the GM and, and as hockey fans, all we do is complain about you no know, moves and GMs don't do much and the same coaches keep getting rehired and the same veterans keep getting recirculated. But Ray Shero went out and tried to make moves. Um, you know, this team has actually had a pretty solid week, uh, you know, yeah. before, before being let go. And on the 24 man roster, 20 of the guys were brought in by, by Shero. Yeah. I agree. I think he's done. I thought he was doing a good job building that foundation brick by brick, like he did with the uh, Penguins. You've, there's talent on that team, and you know he did let the coach go earlier in the season. So you think they would have given them the ownership would have given Shiro a chance to see if how the new coach was going to fare over time. And with his pedigree, I'm surprised that uh, they were so um, you know so quick to pull the plug on him. I I, I am too, and. You know, it, they're not going to make the playoffs, and P.K. Subban's been a, a substantial disappointment. I mean, he just doesn't have as much in the tank as he, as he used to. He's not the same skater. Yep. Uh, you know, he's not as quick on the ice. But that being said, I, I don't understand what the goal is and to do it so quickly. And, you know, I hope there's nothing else going on. You know, why teams think they can win so quickly when they're not, you know, he, he made every move that you'd want him to make. It's disappointing. You, you know, one of the things – you know, you look at – they're, they're a lot better shape than I would say teams like the Sabres and Red Wings, and, you know, especially the Sabres that looked like they were in such good shape 17 months ago and now just look like a complete dumpster fire. And and the, the, that, that, that fan base is ready to just tear everything down. Or the Red Wings who have a minus – they're almost at like minus 80 goal differential. I know. They're going to be the worst team – they could be the worst team in hockey history right now. Um, well, that's saying that, a lot. There's been a lot of lousy teams in National Hockey League history. That's saying a lot. Uh, Detroit, though, and you, you know, the, the knee jerk, I shouldn't say knee jerk reaction, but the first reaction you get when you think of the Detroit Red Wings, they still have so much equity, though, in the bank because of all the winning they had done, really leading right up to this past decade. You know, and, you know, they, they, they lost their coach, their Hall of Fame coach, even though Toronto just let him go, uh, Babcock. I still, you know, you don't look at Detroit the same way as you, like you say, Buffalo, which amazing. Every year they, they do this, right? They Every year they, they show so much promise. They draft these young studs. They get off to a decent start. And like you say, it, it turns into a dumpster fire. But I don't know, the Red Wing, uh, the Devils, I mean, Ray Shiro will get a job very quickly in this league. There's no doubt about it. You know, I don't know if Seattle has named their new GM. They probably have. They probably already have a GM in place. 
They almost have to, but if they have it, I'm sure Shira would be a candidate, if not there, somewhere else, you know, during the, the annual firings of GMs around the league. I can see him finding a spot real quick. You know, yeah, I mean, the P.K. Subban thing, that's probably what put the nail in the coffin. I think people saw the decline in Subban. He's been done two or three years now, I think. You know, I think he's been very overrated the last couple of years. And to sign him, I think, was probably a real, I think, exposed Shiro a little bit. I don't know what your thoughts are because he really has not produced. Yeah, you know, he only has... Ten, he only has ten points in forty-five games for the Devils. Right, and he's 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 making he's making a lot more than that. Oh, <laughs> just, incredible! I mean, you know, he's just so out there. You know, he's just such a he's a larger than life character. You know, and you know, dating Lindsey Vaughn and everything else. And uh, I think the Devils thought they got a real superstar, page six type of guy, but who could also deliver on the ice. And when his ice play uh, doesn't match you know his you know his uh, visibility i think that's always a problem but um yeah it's interesting um you know the top teams in the league are continuing to play like that you know some of them got off to a slow start of as you and i talked rob but the cream is definitely rising to the top right now with the st louis blues and the boston bruins and you know some of the 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 colorado uh, the avalanche are playing well for a young team and you know, is a lot of all the best teams are really starting to um, to rise to power. Don't you agree? I do, and I think um, it's it, these wild card races are going to be great. I think, especially in the in the West, um, Vegas. Yeah, I'm I'm loving these. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm yeah, them in Vancouver and what's going to happen in Edmonton and and so on. Um, I think I think it's starting. Yeah, you're right. I think it's starting to even out. Uh, again, we're in. Here we are again with the Rangers. Uh, yeah, let's let's get to the Rangers. Uh, what are your thoughts about what's happening in goal with the New York Rangers right now? Well, uh, you, uh, I'm going to say I'm a little surprised what I read about Georgiev over the weekend and that they're shopping him. I, I was a little surprised by that. And we've talked about on the show that they can't have they can't be spending twelve million dollars on goaltenders next season. And I guess they're in a position that if they keep him, that's where they're going to be. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, this it's you know, when adults make decisions in life, there's always consequences, right? And you know, the biggest fear I've always had is letting the the tail wag the dog. And in the Rangers case, letting guys like Henrik Lundqvist drive the direction of the team, both in the short term and the long term. Now, it's obvious if Lundqvist was not earning the money he was earning, if he did not have a no trade contract, if he had won a couple of Stanley Cups, the whole thing would be different. He would be if, let's just say right now he was earning decent salaries. You know he was it was not back ended. He had no no trade. He would be gone, and the Rangers would have a young, outstanding tandem goalie tandem of Georgiev and Shesterkin right now. And to read that now they are trying to figure this whole thing out, and you know what that means. They're not going to let Lundqvist go which I think is ludicrous and I think is going to stunt their growth. It's going to stunt their ability to become a perennial uh, contender sooner rather than later. They should be moving him for an asset, and they should be letting Georgiev play with, with Shesterkin. This is a, you and I talked about this last show. It, he's, the game has evolved to being a goalie rotating system like it was back in the 70s. They're, it's very cyclical. Uh, you know, these, these, these things happen every once in a while. You get one goalie dominating the sport per team, and then you, got, you know you got the – the rotation system, which they have right now. But why would – Georgia was going to win a Stanley Cup in this league, and I'm afraid it's not going to be with the New York Rangers. I think the kid is mentally tough. He's a great athlete. He's 23 years old. Every time he played last year and this year, with you know a few moments where – a few games where he did, he, did, he did not play well. But why would you move a Georgia with his track record, his ability to play in precious spots, and move him for really nominal – because he hasn't been around long enough for a team to really give up significant assets for him at this point in time. I would think it would be a colossal blunder for them to do that. And another thing, Shesterkin is pulling the same crap that Leah San- not maybe to the extent, but Krasoff, Leah Sanderson, there was, there's a concern within the Ranger organization, I believe, that he would opt to go back to the KHL again if they didn't promote him right away. So, I mean, this is ridiculous when these 23- and 24-year-old kids are determining 
who sits and who plays up in the parent club. I think it's absolutely, and they haven't accomplished anything yet. So that's my soapbox. What do you have to say about it? <laughs> you know, I, again, I, I'm just thinking, I, th- I think this comes down to how much money they want, they, they want in net. Um, I think the priority should be trading Kreider and Ryan Stone, Strom, maybe even Faust, um, because they got a reason, you know, because they're going to, you know, they're all free agents. They, right now, I think their biggest priority is going to be, be re-signing Anthony D'Angelo. Agreed. And, you know, get only, you know, it would be nice. I think you can get some picks for Kreider. I don't know if you're going to get a first for Kreider. Um, he is 28. But I, unless they're going to re-sign him, they, they have to move him. And we'll get in the situation where Georgiev is a free agent. And how much, you know, how much Shurkin's not. Well, let me ask you. Is he an unrestricted free agent or is he a restricted he's free agent? He's a restricted free agent. Okay. That's a little different than the National Hockey League, right? Um, I mean, it, it is, but, you know, they don't, you don't want a situation where, you know, where we've seen now where these guys get unsigned and you're going into training camp and he's a question mark. He's going to he's gonna demand at least $3 million, maybe two and a half. So there you go. You two and a half million, you have $11 million in net. Well, that gets to my point, doesn't it, Rob? I mean, you've seen the way Lundqvist is playing right now. He's got one year left after this. It's that contract that is keeping you from keeping another elite goalie in your organization. Now, I think when you discuss Kreider and Strom and Foss, it's kind of like almost like a smokescreen in that, yeah, you have to make a decision on Kreider. And you're right. You got to move him. He's had his chance with the Rangers. Uh, he's too up and down. Um, you're right. I, don't, you, I would be shocked that they can get a first-round pick for him. But you can, you can, get, some, you can get some valuable assets. Strom I would keep because he's got a terrific chemistry with Panarin. I would not move. Strom is their second leading point getter right now. He's finally come into the, to being the player the Islanders thought they drafted five, six years ago. The kid, he had a, he had a, a, a brain cramp the other day, obviously. And he was benched for a great, a great part of the game. But Strom has done everything and then some that Quinn has asked him to do. Faust, I agree. Faust, you know, he's just a guy. You know, I know every coach loves him. He works hard. He's a good team player. But to me, he's just a guy. So, yeah, you want to move Foss, great. Move Kreider, great. I think you got to keep Strom. But that does not address the major issue. The major issue is the goaltending issue with the Rangers right now. Why would you give up a guy like Georgiev? He deserves the $3 million. If you get Georgiev and Shesterkin on a rookie contract, you got two elite young goaltenders in this league. And you got a guy that's on the on, – he's got one year to go. He's not going to be with the Rangers in 2022. Next year is his last year. He has his, – his, he's, he's like Eli. He is, his productivity on the ice has diminished greatly over the last couple of years. He's not the same goalie. So you're going to have this guy hang around getting $9 million a year or whatever it is for the rest of this year and all of next year, and you're going to lose Georgia. See, that is so New York Rangers. That, that's, that's, how, that's why this team does not win. That's why this team does not compete every year as bona fide Stanley Cup contenders. It's, 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 this is the stuff that drives – Ranger fans like myself who've seen this crap so many times, poor decisions, you know. Um, so anyway, so I think that's the issue. Everything else to me is secondary. They got to get this goaltending situation squared away. And Shesterkin making threats, or his agent making threats, or implied threats, or I mean, did you read? Not, did you not read the same thing I did? That uh, there's a, a concern that he might opt out and try to go back to the KHL if he's not brought up. No, I read that. I, I still don't know where you're sending uh, where you're sending Lundqvist though. You're not sending him anywhere. The only team that needs a goaltender right now, or needs help that's in that's in a playoff push, that really needs goaltending, maybe Nashville, because Rene has just been having such a down year. Both of them haven't been good. Um, I mean, maybe Edmonton needs a goalie to help out. They, you know, their their save percentage is hurting. Uh, no one wants that. No one wants that salary. The only teams that have cap room are teams that don't want don't, don't want Henrik Lundqvist. Yeah, maybe Lundqvist is not market. Maybe if he, even if he didn't have that albatross of a contract, maybe there are maybe there are Stanley Cup contending teams that really don't think he can deliver them the cup. You know, I mean, it's just uh, I don't know. It's just a situation where I hate to have these young kids to you know determine you know how this organization is going to go forward. I mean, this guy's not going to be around in two years. He's not a, he's not a, he's, you know, what do you, I don't know. 
these no trade contracts are just, you know, they're just crazy. You know, listen, we've seen it before where general managers, you know, they slip out to the media, they point, they, they bring this stuff up. So that's not so much that the fans can turn against players, but, you know, if Ranger management articulated the fact that, you know, we're kind of hamstrung right now, he's got a no trade contract. Maybe the fans will start putting a little pressure on Lundquist to maybe to loosen it up. You know, maybe this halo effect that he's got, like Eli has with Giant fans and Lundquist has with Ranger fans. Maybe if Jeff Gordon and Ranger management said, you know, listen, you know, we'd like to move him, but, you know, he, you know, we're committed to keeping him because he's got this no trade. And I mean, there's ways, <laughs> there's ways that they can make it a little bit more uncomfortable for Lundquist not to play ball. I mean, uh, Lundquist knows he's not going to win a Stanley Cup with the New York Rangers. He's just fat and happy right now. He's very content right now. He doesn't want to leave, but at the expense of the future of this club. If he really loves the Rangers so much, he should accept a trade or, I don't know, maybe it's too, uh, maybe I'm not looking at it the right way, but um, I think that's going to hold them back, and I, I agree with you, Rob. I think they're going to move uh, George Evan. Mean, he is going to win a Stanley Cup with somebody. I think he's that type of a goaltender. I really do, you know, so. All right. All well, right. I'll tell you what I – all, all, I, all I want is for the Rangers not to make a dumb trade to try to bring in assets to get to make a push into the playoffs this year. Right. I think we can agree on that. Totally. If you're going to make a trade, do it for picks and prospects. That is it. Do you think John Davidson is uh, savvy enough and sharp enough not to do that, being that he's back in the in the fishbowl with the New York Rangers again, back in uh, Madison Square Garden? I sure hope so. I don't think it has, I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with him. Right. I think it's it's from above and how badly. If they get it, if they have any inkling of or any belief that they're going to be able to get a home play two home playoff games, I think Dolan goes for it. Wow, what, what are they six now? Six six spot in the wild card right now behind the uh, Sabers and, and the Blue Jackets, right? They um... they're far off, so hopefully we'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see Kako come back in the second half and play a little bit better. You know, I'd like to see, um, oh, we already talked about the, uh, Lundquist, uh, thing. I hope Georgia, uh, if he doesn't get traded, I hope, uh, he's able to play a few games the second half of the year. And, uh, I mean, I want Shesterkin to, to do well. I mean, if he can lead us to the promised land, awesome. If he could be the one, a goalie and Georgia one B, I'd be very happy with that or vice versa. You know, if, uh, if this kid's the real deal and he deserves to stay with the club, Awesome. But we'll see. You know, we'll see. Um, the defense core has to really get it together. You know, like uh, D'Angelo has to keep it up. And you're right, that that contract is going to be very interesting at the end of the year. Uh, Truba has, has to establish himself, I think, the second half as the player they thought they were getting from Winnipeg. And um, you like to see Fox and um, Lingering continue their uh, ascension. You know, I hope they continue to develop. And so it should be interesting. It should be interesting. So um, any Closing thoughts on the league or uh, the New York Rangers right now before we head into the Polish Prince, Pete Stemkowski. Oh, I do. But let's, why don't we move on? So the Stemmer, interesting guy, number 21. My recollection of Stemkowski is, you know, is significant. You know, obviously the one that comes to mind is the triple overtime goal. I remember being a 15-year-old kid in April, getting ready for uh, JV baseball practice the next day. And the Rangers, listening to Marv Albert on the radio, again, this is pre-cable. The game was blacked out in New York, and Marv was doing the game. And I remember I had an early, morning pra- early, early morning practice the next day. And I had the transistor radio under the pillow, and I was in bed listening to the game. And, you know, the first overtime, the second overtime. I remember and Stan Mikita hitting the, hitting the post. I remember reading about it the next day on an open net. He had Jockman out of position hitting the post, and I remember reading the next day, I guess it was the Long Island Press, or maybe it was Newsday, how Makita said, you know, I make that shot like 99 times out of 100. He had a yawning net, almost like the Rick Nash <laughs> opening with the Kings in, uh, in overtime uh, in the Stanley Cup uh, Finals a couple of years ago, and he hit the freaking post, and thank God for that. Actually, I think the Blackhawks hit two posts in that period, and uh, Stemkowski obviously uh, wins the game for the Rangers in triple overtime. And the place went absolutely nuts. I think it was, I think it was after midnight that game ended, uh, if memory serves me correct. But Stemmer was a very interesting player. I remember him coming to the Rangers for Larry Brown. It was kind of a trade that was a yawn trade. You know, Emo made a move in early October, I guess it was, in 1970-71. But he had a very good career with Detroit leading up to that. He played with some of the Hall of Fame greats and Alex Del Vecchio and Mahavich and um, Gordie Howe. 
And he won. He was on the last Toronto Stanley Cup winning team in 67. They had cups of coffee with them, I guess, for about three or four years, going back and forth from their minor league teams. Had a very good rookie playoff year, scoring 12 points. I think he had five goals. And, uh, yeah, he was a major part coming up as a rookie in that last championship team for Toronto in 1967. Yeah, he, you know, he, the beginning of his career is pretty storied. In fact, he's, he was involved in one of the biggest trades of all time, the Detroit-Toronto trade, the Frank Mahovlich, essentially for, with Norm Ullman, two Hall of Famers in the trade, and Paul Henderson, who's, you know, Mr. Mr. Canada, really, mm-hmm. at, least in the, at least in the 70s. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so he, he you, you said it great how he played on some, some important hockey teams, you know, you know, that Toronto team and then playing with Hall, you know, playing with a lot of Hall of Famers, both in Toronto and Detroit before coming over to the uh, to the Rangers. Yeah, he played with Tim Horton, uh, who later became his teammate again uh, with the New York Rangers. And uh, I think Tim Horton might have been on the ice for that um, for that triple overtime winner. And of course, Tim Horton fame later went on to uh, own all those uh those donut shops across the Canada and the United States. And he was a, I think Tim Horton was a hall of famer. I, I know he was an elite player. I think he's also in the hockey hall of fame, Tim Horton, if memory serves me correctly, playing with the Rangers in Toronto. I, play, I think he played Buffalo too uh, at some point in time in his career, but some was a great faceoff guy. Email would always put him on the ice for important. He was year in and year out. He was the Rangers most important faceoff man. Very, very good faceoff guy. He was good down low. He's not a, for a bigger guy at that time, again, I was always hoping he would be a little bit more aggressive. You know, I was hoping he'd be a little bit more physical, especially against the teams like the Bruins and the Flyers. But uh, he was a decent scorer. He had a good nose for the net, uh, had good hands, uh, again, down low. One of the things that used to drive Ranger fans crazy, he used to have that low, slow, winding slap shot from the blue line that 95 times out of 100 would be deflected and the puck would go into the crowd. Every time he'd take that long, slow, winding slap shot and it was always deflected. That was uh, one of the bugaboos that we had with him as a Ranger fan that people remember back back in the day. But he was a good player. He was a very solid player and he had, you know, 25, I think he had five 20-goal seasons. Uh, I think his best year was with the Rangers in 74, 75, the year they were eliminated by the, uh, the Islanders in the playoffs. He had uh, 70 points. Um, yeah, very, very, um, very underrated player. Made the All Star team once, and he played for your Kings his last year in the league. That's that's right. He did. He 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 did play. Actually, he's, you know, not too bad. Thirteen goals. Yeah. For a not great Kings team. <laughs> it's funny. The Rangers and Kings have a lot of things in common. Um, it's where great players go to die. You know. <laughs> <laughs> At least back in the seventies and eighties. <laughs> Yeah, in the 90s, too. Yeah, there were a lot of good players that wound up their careers with the Rangers and Kings. Yeah, he had his moments, a very good playoff performer. And uh, he's a, he was a funny guy, too. He was the one that, I believe, in one of Stan Fischler's books that I read about the Rangers, where, you know, the players used to get what they call the Philadelphia Spectrum Flu, where they hated <laughs> whenever, whenever they had to go play in Philadelphia with those with those very aggressive, the Broad Street Bullies, I mean, the fans were took on the personality of the Flyers, obviously, back in the 70s and 80s. Players would actually call in sick, right? They would actually uh, feign an injury or they would not want to play with minor minor uh, ills because it was such an, a, a tough place to play. And and I think that was one of Stemmer's uh, lines that, uh, you know, the, the, the spectrum flew. And, um, and it was so true, you know. T- even the Rangers, when they went in there, they just uh, – teams played scared in Philadelphia. And I know he and Schultz – uh, went at it a couple of times, and um, later on they became teammates with the Kings. I guess uh, I read something where, in the research for the show, that uh, he and Schultz became f- pretty friendly, and that Schultz helped him find a place in L.A. when he was when he moved there. Yeah, I, abs- no, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's funny you say that about Philadelphia. I don't think we have many places like that right now. No. Well, the Boston Boston Garden was similar to that back in the seventies, but not to the same extent as with Philadelphia. There was no more intimidating place to play than the Philadelphia Spectrum in the 70s and 80s. Nowhere close. Maybe the Coliseum when the Islanders win their heyday, but even then they weren't as, um, they weren't as a violent a team as the Philadelphia Flyers were. And, and the fans were just, uh, that was a really, really tough place to play. Um, yeah, Stamkowski, very interesting guy. Um, pretty good uh, junior career. 
like you said, he played with some great players. That Toronto team in 67, who would have thought that back in the day when they were they and the Canadians were dominating, that uh, that would be their last Stanley Cup championship team in 1967 with some great, great, great players. Yeah, a lot of hockey fans love reminding Maple Leafs fans about that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's already true. You wonder if Toronto's on their way, though. You wonder if, um, you know, if Toronto is now on their way to, with the new coach, you know, utilizing that offensive talent that they have, and maybe, you know, they're not too far away from, from the Stanley Cup. But um, but anyway, Stemmer is now, uh, he does radio for the New York Rangers. He's, uh, I think he's now got the full-time gig as color ana- analyst for uh, with, with Dom LaGreca, I guess. I guess he was subbing for uh, Dave Maloney the last couple of years. But now every time I turn on the radio, I think he's pretty regular now as far as doing the color. And I know he was with the San Jose Sharks back in uh, the yeah. early, right? He was doing TV and color for them around 2000, 2001, 2002. So yeah, he's, uh, he's been on both coasts doing some, uh, some hockey. Yeah. And you know, he's, um, you know, I definitely enjoy the, you know, I don't listen to as much games in the radio as I used to, because you don't really need to anymore, but um no, he, he does a good job. It's it's nice keeping the you know, kind of what we have going on with this podcast. Keeping some of these guys around with the organization is great to hear. Yeah, and I was wondering if I would if Stemmer would qualify because you know I, we like to keep these guys. You know, the, obviously there's a lot of guys from the '70s and '80s that we have not profiled, but they and the reason for that is because they have a lot of visibility, whether they're on TV a lot or they're very very out there with the Rangers organization with their. Um, you know, with their special events and that type of thing. And Stemkowski being a radio guy, it's kind of, he's kind of visible in a way, but, um, but there's a lot of Ranger fans that probably don't even remember or aren't even aware of his triple overtime goal and the important role he played in those very powerful Ranger teams of the seventies that just missed out. You know, when Rattel got hurt in, uh, during that, uh, Stanley cup final year in 72, 73, Stemkowski picked up a lot of the slack. You know, he really did. And uh, it was guys like he and Walker Chuck um, that really had to take on more of an important role with the team. So he became a fan favorite. You know, the Polish Prince, Stemmer, number 21, bigger guy in the ice, fun-loving type of guy, real character. Um, he's had some moments, some very fond moments as a Ranger player. So, yeah, so that's kind of the story on number 21, P. Stemkowski. Any uh, other thoughts, Rob, before we end the podcast? Yeah, you know, um, really, I would love someone. I would love someone to um, to make an, a, a strong movie about that that Bruins Ranger series. <laughs> you know, it's um, I, th- I think one of the, one of the best um, moments in in Rangers. You know, what could have been at least of the '70s hockey history, um, and these teams that came after that. You know, that he got to be on. Um, it's too bad he couldn't, you know, he was just a little too old to have made it to the 78, 79 teams. You know, he was out of there in 77. Right. But uh, some, some great, some great teams there um, in the seventies that I, I love just that we, that we keep talking about. You know, the Yankees have the yes network and they have, you know, you've seen it before. Uh, I forget the name of the show, but uh, just the greatest moments in Yankees history. They got the old world series games you see on TV and the Rangers, for some reason, they have nothing in the archives of the teams from the seventies and eight. I mean, you see some grainy clips that I think are really from the other teams archives on the Rangers, but you, there's, I don't understand how a major New York area sports organization has so little in the way of our, you know, film in the archives. I mean, it's not like the 1970s or the 1930s. I mean, the 1970s had major television productions back then. And it's amazing how little Madison Square Garden has, the New York Rangers have, Channel 9, all the old channels of, I mean, you're right, that game with the Boston Bruins should be on on Rangers history or Rangers television, MSG, every so often, like you see the nineteen the Yankees-Dodgers 1977 World Series or 1978 World Series. I just, you're right, you, you lose a lot of that because those were some, some of the best games not only in Rangers history, but National Hockey League history. So, yeah, I, I don't get it. I just don't understand it. It's just very weird. I don't know if you could – I'd be shocked if the Boston Bruins, the Canadians, the Maple Leafs don't have all their big games from the 60s and 70s somewhere in their archives that are shown locally on, on their – you know, in their cities. I don't know. I'd be surprised. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. You know, one of the things we talk about is how I think for Yankee fans – or, or Mets fans, you know, Mets fans could talk about 69 or the 73 team 
um, where the teams in the early, you know, mid eighties, you know, just name that whole lineup and, you know, you know, I don't think we have that with the Rangers and, I, and I'm hoping to bring that back. Yeah. I mean, how else are we going to remember some of like some of the lines that some of these players, you know, like just for example, when, when in between, uh, we have to end with this, I guess, when in between uh, the second and third overtime, you know, there was uh, some talk that Emil Francis said, you know, guys, I know this is going above and beyond your pay grade, but somebody score a goal and let's get out of here type of thing. Let's win this thing. And Stemmer said, yeah, let's get out of here before last call. You know, that was one of the things he said. Or, or all the places, well, you, know, we got, you know, there's, no, there's not going to be any place to get a beer if we don't score a goal in this period. So, I mean, those are the types of guys, you know, kind of the clown, not the clowns of the game, the characters of the game, the guys who kept things loose in the clubhouse, you know, and every sport has them, every team has them. And with the Rangers, it was Pete Stemkowski. And, um, you know, there's a lot of happy-go-lucky guys that, uh, you know, kept the locker rooms loose, and he was one of those guys. And, but there's not much in the way of history, in the way of, um, you know, television footage that kind of reinforces that or brings back memories. So, uh, well, maybe this podcast, Rob, will go a long way in doing that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, any final words, either on Simkowski or the New York Rangers or the league before we, um, before we head out and close out the podcast? Well, I'll, I'll just say, you know, as um, you know, we lost uh, the best rock drummer of all time, you know, Neil Peart over the weekend. Yeah. And- um, he was a huge hockey guy, a uh, huge hockey fan. Um, and for, for those that haven't seen it, he has a great rendition of the theme to hockey night in Canada. Uh, look that up on YouTube. Um, just, just wonderful. Just, you know, even though this isn't a music podcast, he definitely had ties to the hockey world, especially as someone from Ontario. Yeah. He, um, he was one of my best drummers, uh, rush, obviously he's, they say he was one of the top two or three drummers. And, you know, I view him on YouTube once in a while. I remember reading a story on him a couple of years ago. He had a tough, he had a tough life. And, and personally, I guess he lost his daughter uh, to an accident a couple of decades ago, you know, and the effects, the obvious effects that that would have on anybody if that ever happened. But remember him saying as a kid growing up that um, he loved hockey, but he couldn't skate worth a damn. You know, he said, <laughs> I was always the worst skater. I could barely put on, I could barely stand up on the ice. So I guess his physical energies went to, to being one of the best drummers that ever, um, that ever played. And, um, you know, Rush is a very unique band, a Canadian band, or a three piece band, right? Three guys that, only three guys in the band and he was one of the greatest drummers you'll ever see. And, uh, but yeah, I didn't realize he had such close ties to the national hockey league, um, other than his own interest in the sport and his own, um, you know, inability as he says to be able to skate. But, uh, that, that's, that's, that's interesting that, um, he actually, uh, did some stuff with the national hockey league. Yeah, definitely. Wow. All right, Rob. Well, listen, thanks, bud. Great podcast. We'll come up with another player. Uh, maybe we'll do a series, uh, for the next show. Fans, again, if you have any, um, I bring this up all the time. If you have any topics that you want Rob and I to uh, to talk about, again, we go off the menu uh, every once in a while. Um, let us know on the email, and we'll be sure to um, to uh, look at it very closely. And you know, you can find our podcast on your favorite podcast channels. So, on behalf of Rob Berger, this is Tom Browning saying thank you for tuning in to the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production.